Well, I'm 26 years old and I've never dated because no one has ever asked me out and I've never actively looked either. Hey guys, it's Stephen here and welcome to another episode of Heart of the Matter. Now that clip you've just heard, it's something a young woman shared with us when we asked her why she did not date. And she's not alone. In the latest marriage and parenthood survey taken in 2021, half of the single surveyed said they were not currently dating. And among them, 38% had never dated before. I mean, never. Top reasons given? They said their social circle is small, they don't have many opportunities to meet potential partners, so we thought, let's find out more. We conducted our own mini-survey on Instagram. Of the 136 people who responded, nearly half were single. And their reasons for being single? They said they tried, but it didn't work out. They are focusing on career or on studies. Some also said that dating was a very tedious and tiring process. There were mismatch expectations and... There was also a fear of commitment or failure. And from the lot, 19% of them also said they simply prefer being single. Now let's be clear, there's nothing wrong with being single and we're not debating that today. But for those who want to find a partner, why is it so hard for them to do so in this day and age? That's what we want to talk about. If you're a regular listener, you'll realise that this is a little bit different from our usual topics. But at the same time, we felt it's a topic that is, uh, well, close to our hearts. I mean, after all, the show is called Heart of the Matter. Let's strap in and get ready for an honest, no holds barred view on what's going on. What's driving this change in society? Is it true there is little chance for young people to meet? And what are the biggest socio-economic issues at play? With me to discuss this are Violet Lim, CEO of Lunch Actually. She's been in the dating business for almost two decades now. Hi, hi, Stephen. Thanks for having me on the show. Vanessa Chan, a 22-year-old student. Hi there, thanks for having me. Hope this is a great advertisement for me as a single. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. And Alan, he's also a 22-year-old student and he prefers not to be identified. I am uh, studying in a local university. All right, guys. Are you single and ready to mingle? Okay, no, that's not true. I just couldn't resist saying that because it just sounds so catchy. <laughs> But let's start. Singapore is not the only country in the world with a rising number of singles. China, Japan, Korea, they've all got the same challenges. Violet, I'm going to start with you. You've been matchmaking many people for many years now. Yes. Lay it out for us. What has really changed in the past 10 to 15 years? I would say it's interesting because in the last 10 to 15 years, that's where Tinder started. And Tinder changed the entire dating scene because previously people always find it very hard to even meet new people. But with dating apps such as Tinder, Bumble, Coffee Meets Bigger, like people that is kind of like at your fingertips, you can always like swipe and chat and hopefully meet up. But at the same time, I think with this instant technology, it brings a different set of problems. So I think for one, it gives people this idea that they have a lot of choices and as a result of that, they are not willing to commit or even choose because they just feel that, oh, this is good, but maybe the next one is better. Oh, this is good, maybe the next one is better. Ah. So it just keeps going on and on. The other part of it is that the scamming is kind of putting people off, like catfishing, scamming, being ghosted. There are also people who are going through what we call swiping fatigue. <laughs> so it's very fun when you kind of start off swiping and chatting, but if you are doing it for months and months, eventually it kind of feels like a chore or even work. Yeah. That's another challenge. Wow, I've never heard of swiping <laughs> fatigue. And the fact that yeah. having too many choices actually becomes something bad. Vanessa, have you ever been on any of these dating platforms before? Well, I did have a brief stint on Bumble a couple of years back when I thought that I wanted to give it a try. But I think I had texting fatigue. It's just, <laughs> I'm a bad texter to begin with, right? And I, I can barely find it in me to reply to texts with people I love, cherish, care about. Wow. So imagine having to hard carry these awful conversations with random people on the internet. Like, Yeah, I think that's a different problem you need to address when you're not even replying to the people you love. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So that's a scary thought. Ellen, what do you think of what Violet said? Yeah, I do agree that in general, the way that apps work is supposed to help you have more choices. I think it's kind of the same thing as with like, say, oh, now you have more shows on Netflix, but do you really have more shows? Do you really mm. have more options in the sense like it becomes a fatigue when you are overwhelmed with choice. Right. So ironically, 
Technology has made it more accessible to many more people, but too many so that we now are spoiled for choice. Violet, so thinking back to the old school days when I, we were growing up, dating was really face-to-face. You had to pick up a phone, call someone. Did that work better? Uh, it's a very different setting. I think we are maybe about the same age group. So you remember the past where you're interested in someone, you actually will pick up the phone. It's like a phone, right? It's not even a mobile phone. <laughs> and then you wait for it to ring. Someone will pick it up. Chances are it's not the person. You hope the father doesn't answer. Yeah, chances are it will be <laughs> the father, <laughs> mother, brother, sister or someone, right? It's not going to be the person. And then you'll pick up the courage to say, oh, I would like to speak to who and who. And finally, the person come to call and you have to ask the person out. So that's a lot of anticipation. There's a lot of excitement. But now, dates have become like commodities. People are no longer excited about it. People are not dressing up for it. It's very much like, oh, okay, law, it's just another date. And people can go on multiple dates in a week. And some people even go on multiple dates in a day. What? <laughs> yeah. I think that's you just can call it. Oh, like on the same night? Yeah. Oh my gosh, you have more than one date in the same night. Yeah, and I feel like if you're doing that, you just want the free stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know the other part like Vanessa was talking about, the chatting fatigue. So you need to think about it. Like now, you are competing with a lot of people without really knowing who they are. Because when you're on a dating app, you meet people, they are not only talking to you. They are talking to like multiple people, like 10, 15, 20. And people cannot be talking to 15, 20 people all the time, right? So in a way, you are constantly being assessed, like you are in this exam that you didn't even know of. So you're like, okay, what should I say? I must sound interesting. If I sound boring, the person is just going to ghost me or blue tick me. So after a while, it gets a bit challenging. And I think that's why I always tell singers that if you're going to be using dating apps, make sure that you go offline as soon as you can. Ah, so just use it as an introduction yeah. to find the connection and then go for a real physical date and meet yeah. them face to face. What do you guys think? Vanessa, Alan, is that something you would do? Too many choices, too many distractions. Hard to figure someone out too, right? You don't know them for real. It is ideally good to take things offline as soon as possible. I think from my experience, a lot of people are not really open to that so soon some girls they'll be like oh I want to talk for like a month before I take things off talk as in like chat with them online for a month yeah yeah on the messaging app can you call them can you pick up the phone and have an actual voice from my experience some people are open to it some people not so much like uh, I don't know okay nowadays Gen Z's have a phobia of picking up the phone you know (laughs) it's another problem that might arise Yeah. And, uh, Why'd you call me? We were texting. We were WhatsApping. Yeah, Why did you call right. me? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Taking things offline in itself can be difficult. Of course, once things go offline, it's easier to tell if you guys can gel together or not. But right. getting there is a bit difficult. And then once you get there, there's the possibility of disappointment. To even get to being offline is already tiring. And then once you get offline, things may just not happen. And I think that process is very exhausting because you prepare so much or you hype up something that could be only to be disappointed in the end, you know? Okay, so it sounds like almost because online you put yourself as someone a little bit nicer, a bit more charming, whatever. And then you meet them in real life and you're saying you might be disappointed. Yeah, in essence, when you put yourself on a dating app, you are playing into a role, right? Which is a role that the other party might want. Shouldn't the role be you as yourself? Yes and no. I think it's almost like a performative aspect to a dating app. It's almost like you're doing your own PR. Ah, (laughs) I think Ellen really has a point because the challenge is that you are competing with so many people. Let's say some people, they are actually very interesting when you meet them in person. Their personality is very charming. There are different aspects to them. But the problem when you're using a dating app, people are only reading what you are writing. They don't get to see all these different aspects of you. And like what Ellen has said, if you don't message that much or you don't say that much, then you already will just get eliminated Mm. from the competition. So in a way, you need to uh, dress up your chats a bit. I mean, for years, they've said dating is a bit of a game, right? And it's true. Even in the old days, it was me competing with another guy for the girl or whatever, right? Through your other techniques of when to call back, when not to call and things like that. Vanessa, what do you think? You saying you've never dated before, is that correct? I've never been in a relationship, yeah. Okay, but you've gone on dates. Yeah. Not very many, but that's also by choice. (laughs) Okay, and tell us why. Why have you chosen not to go on more dates? I guess it goes back to the idea of what you consider fun, right? And how you are living your life, how you want to spend that time. So I think going back to a couple of things, really interesting things that was said earlier. I think in the past, dating might have been a game. It's that idea of the unexpected, the fun. But 
with apps, which is so data-driven, algorithmic in that sense, as Violet said, it's more like dating is an assessment. It's an assessment of do you hit all of these criteria? Mm. And the dating profile app is very neatly categorized. What is your religious background? What is your education? Which, you know, to Singaporeans is very important. (laughs) All these different metrics that you're being weighed on and assessed for. And not only that, the same way that assessments are looking for very specific things. There's this end goal. Okay, we say that this is a dating app. We are all here for specific purposes. Whereas if you're meeting people in real life for whatever reason, it's a lot more organic. And there are a lot more possible combinations of connections that can arise from that. And it's not always in a romantic sense, right? It's just a pure human connection that could look different and could be different in the way that it adds to your life. Not just this very fixed idea, okay, we're going on a date. The intention is for us to move to the next step. It's such a Singaporean progression, isn't it? Like the conveyor belt of life. I must first process myself through these fields of data and yeah. then be assessed and then boom, I'm going to be married with a BTO and a baby by 25. Yeah, otherwise, how else to get my BTO flip? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's so process-driven, don't you think? That's so boring. Life is yeah. just not like that, I think. Where's the spontaneity? Where's the fun? Ah, okay. Let's talk a bit about that because expectations is one big area. And you're right. You go to a platform, you're like, okay, tonight I'm going to find myself a date. And then you log in online and you start <laughs> searching versus just saying, hey, I'm going to meet up with my friends. And then you are at a cafe and then you start talking to someone and you find that, hey, this is a nice person. You exchange numbers. So do those expectations change the reality for you guys? Do you think people have uh, perhaps unrealistic expectations when coming into these platforms? We all have our idea of the perfect guy and girl. And Violet, I'm sure you've heard many stories saying, oh, this guy's not tall enough, <laughs> this uh, girl's not whatever enough, yes, right? Definitely. I mean, So expectations, how significant a role are they in the scheme of things? It has always been there. And now I think it's even higher than ever before and I definitely blame Korean dramas. <laughs> <laughs> so so don't get me wrong, I watch Korean dramas but I see it as an indulgement. I know that it's not real, you know, and I'm like, okay, this is just fairy tales or something. But I think a lot of our uh, young people now, they grow up watching Korean dramas and the numbers have shown that a lot of them have never dated in real life before. Okay. What, what, what's wrong with the Korean <laughs> drama? What is it? Wow. The boys are too pretty, the girls are too pretty, <laughs> is it? Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> It's just the expectation of maybe how a girl is or the guy, you know. Okay, i just give you an example. Like the first Korean drama I ever watched is Descendants of the Sun because everybody is watching it and I'm like, what is so great about this? I'm watching it for research purpose, right? So this guy is the soldier, but he's so pretty. And then he is muscular at the same time. He fights well. He's so romantic. He's everything, basically. Yeah, he doesn't exist like, in real life. Exactly. <laughs> As you watch enough of this, eventually you'll have a certain expectation. For example, like when we first started, girls were maybe like looking for guys who was like 1.75. Mm-hmm. I told them that, do you know the average height of Singaporean men is 1.71? <laughs> But now it's just getting taller and taller. Now it's like 1.85 because all these Korean opas are so tall, right? Okay, 18 years later, now the average height of Singaporean men is 1.73. It is still a big gap. (laughs) Wow. I've never heard that before. Well, that really surprises me. Ellen, how? How do you feel being compared to all these Korean dramas out there? Is that a challenge for guys here as well? In many ways, yes. Um, I was watching another podcast by a psychologist and he discussed in many ways while we have made various strides in like gender equality, we have not evolved to accept that maybe it is harder for the men to fulfill the roles of the traditional men. So like the expectations of the traditional men are still there, but at the same time, it is becoming harder for him to do so because of various factors like um, he needs to provide for the family, he needs to earn a certain amount of money, that sort of thing. Okay. And you're saying it's harder for the guy to achieve those today? You know, rising cost of living. Right. Maybe sometimes the man will want to be a stay-home dad. Okay. 
But I think society has not really reached a point where they are able to accept that. But I have to challenge you a bit on that because imagine if my daughter, she's still too young, but if she came home and she said, I want to go out with this guy who doesn't have a job, who has no future, I don't think he can provide for my family. I'll be like, I don't think so. You know what I mean? So isn't that a fair expectation to have of someone So regardless of whether they're male or female, I think both sides need to have some kind of prospect of a future. You need to know that their career will improve. Is that something, Vanessa, perhaps would you look for that in a guy? As you mentioned, gender roles and expectations, right? I think that mismatch of expectations is not so much of it being increased compared to the past, it's just different. And that may be what men expect of women and vice versa. Maybe these things are not really magic up. But In the case of the idea of the breadwinner, this is something that I think kind of goes back to how we look at what is a family, right? And what is the role of the partnership within that? And I think that's where it gets a little bit tricky, right? If we're looking at, okay, dual income families or like one person has to be the breadwinner, but that already has a very fixed idea of what your life is going to look like, right? And what relationships are going to look like. For me, in my mind, I don't think we're all out here just hunting bread for ourselves, you know, there's to be a breadwinner. In my ideal life, in my ideal family, it's like the bread is baked communally Ah, in the kitchen. It's not really like we're out here all having to hunt down baguettes. (laughs) So you're saying it doesn't have to be the guy sort of bringing home the baker. I agree, it can be the woman as well. But I'm just saying, I think that when you look for a partner, you want someone with the potential to succeed. And isn't financial security something that everyone looks for? Well, success, it really looks different to everyone, right? And mm-hmm. I guess it's also responding to the country you live in, the circumstances you live in. What that security looks like may not necessarily come from just you and your partner. There's also you and your partner's family, you and your partner's community, you and your partner's work friends. Wait, you wait, know, wait. It's like- so the community is supposed to provide you that security? The family is supposed to provide you that security? Is that what you guys are saying? I'm saying that there are many relationships that can meet the needs that you have to live a good life. Okay. To add on to that point, I think it's very narrow to try and fix it on the certain things like, you know, we mentioned like, oh, now this dating has become a game of ticking boxes. So I feel like maybe in some ways we need to look beyond that. It would be ideal if we can quantify security, as Vanessa said, in more ways than one. Like, you know, emotional security is something very important, right? But like, you're never going to know if someone can make you feel secure emotionally if you never meet them in person, as we mentioned earlier. Perhaps it goes back to the fact that maybe Singaporeans may, I don't want to generalize, but Singaporeans may be more concerned with material things in many ways. And I feel like that just makes things harder in terms of dating. Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Steve Lai. And I'm Teresa Tang. And we are the hosts of the new podcast, CNA Correspondent. From New York to Bangkok, join us as we kick back and chat with our colleagues across the globe about the latest news developments. Look out for our weekly episodes wherever you get your podcasts. So, Ellen, would you go out if a girl asked you out? She made the first move and asked you out. Yeah, sure, why not? I don't see the problem with that. Okay. Yeah, you know, uh, now times are tough. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know when I want to What does that mean? What does that mean by times are tough? Okay, Ellen, it sounds like like you'll go out with anyone who asks you out. No, 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 no. I feel like if I can connect with the person and they ask me out, I'll be more than happy to do so. I don't really think it has to be a case where I ask the girl out. Okay. And I feel like as a guy... I am expected to ask the girl out. Things still feel very patriarchal, even though we are trying to move beyond that. That puts very subconscious expectations on dating. Vanessa, do you still expect the guy to make the first move to ask you out? No, I am actually the type to ask people out. (laughs) Yeah, I have done that. Okay. Violet, Mm -hmm. is this the norm? It's very interesting. So we do annual surveys and then we ask this question, who should do the asking out? It's very interesting because I think women, to a certain extent, they still expect the men to be asking them out. And the men are kind of like, they don't care. It's like anybody can ask anybody out. And I come to the conclusion, is that why nobody is going out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> it becomes a game of chicken. <laughs> if you don't want to ask me out and you don't want to ask 
Yeah, and because, because the, who's flying the plane here? <laughs> right, exactly. Because the girl is like, maybe the guy still should ask me out. And then the guy is like, it doesn't matter. The girl can also ask me out, right? And everybody's just kind of sitting around waiting for each other to ask <laughs> each other out. So it's, it's quite worrying. Yeah, so it becomes a bit challenging that way. I remember one time someone told me, he said, I asked my date to meet me at the gym today, but she didn't show up. That's when I knew the relationship wasn't going to work out. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking with you guys about that. I wish I did not, but I did. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so what about the two of you, Ellen and Vanessa? If I ask you on a scale of one to five, five being most important, how important is it for you to find a partner, Vanessa? Five, I would say. Yeah? Have you got a timeline? Have you given yourself like by the time I'm whatever age hopefully before I die oh okay (laughs) that's my timeline (laughs) okay but you would like to have someone yeah I guess I give myself a lot of latitude because I see a partnership as something that is companionship right in the long term so I'm okay whenever that shows up Alan what about you Uh, I guess like four I think it's part of my life that I think is important for sure but it's not that important to make it a five (laughs) okay so that's where psychologically I'm thinking if I say five, then I am desperate, you see. There's this idea that you cannot come across as desperate. People have to pretend like they are not super interested, even though I am someone who prefers to express his interests in a more direct way, which I think is a challenge because I don't know if it's an Asian thing or like it's a global thing or whatever. Well, are you saying because with these platforms, these online apps, you can't really express yourself? It's just ticking a bunch of boxes, writing a few words. Yeah, let's say for a job interview, you can express that I really want this job. You can express that, oh, I'm so excited to work here, for example. But you can't say that with a relationship, right? You can't be like, oh, I really, really want to get to know you, you know? Actually, why not? Hmm. Vanessa, would you appreciate it if someone came up to you and said, hey, I know we've just met, but I really like you and I want to hang out more with you? Well, I guess there are like two sides to this coin. Because on one hand, I always appreciate emotional honesty and being very upfront with your intentions. So on that front, I think definitely I sympathize with a lot of poor men out there who (laughs) feel like the stereotype is that the desperate guy, we were talking about choices, right? But we all know that on dating apps, the girls have a lot more choices than the guys do. I mean, there's that oppression of the desperate men. But I think while I really empathize with that, there's also the second half where it's really about consent culture, right? Whether or not people are respectful with how they approach you, whether or not they respect your no. I think that's the part where it's very difficult to say that you always want emotional honesty because then sometimes there are some guys who will just be super persistent, even after you've said that I have no interest because they receive some messages to say that you've got to be persistent, you've got to be resilient, you've got to go for what you want. And the girl's just like, please, leave me alone. <laughs> so that's also that aspect, right? Okay, Violet, from what you've heard so far, mm-hmm. what do you think is really the main challenge for our young people today and why so many of them are still single? I think it has been a very interesting conversation because obviously the people I usually work with are people in their late 20s or 30s or even 40s. So hearing from both Vanessa and Ellen today is definitely very refreshing. I hear a couple of challenges. I think one of it is really the role expectations. So I feel sometimes it's like the guys, they are a bit confused about what the women want. On one hand, you're like, okay, you know, you want gender equality. But on the other hand, when I really go for gender equality, then you're kind of like, oh, you know, this guy is so not chivalrous. This guy is so not gentlemanly, right? And then they're just so confused. So I think that's one part of it. The other part of it, it's like very interesting what Ellen has shared that just getting to offline is already so tiring. I think this is something that I really want to spend some time thinking about because the challenge with our younger generation right now is obviously like most of the time they are online. They're like playing games, they're chatting with their friends and both Ellen and Vanessa are saying they don't pick up the call, you know? It's like if you call someone out of the blue, they're like, what's wrong with you? Why do you call me? (laughs) Right? (laughs) Last but not least is also the skill set to really escalate the relationship to the next level. And I think it's also something that the more we do, the better we get at it. Mm And I think the challenge is we are not even doing it because there are just so many roadblocks to start off with. Maybe this explains some of the statistics or the numbers that we have been seeing. 
Vanessa, Ellen, what do you guys think? You're now in this position. What would you do differently? And you guys are still young, so I think there's yeah, still many opportunities that lie yes. ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Ellen, don't worry, okay? Like for guys, right? The older you get, your market value will just go higher and higher. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're like good wine, Ellen. Don't worry. Men are like good wine. <laughs> Uh, but it's true I think there are a lot of challenges I recall years ago I had one friend and we went out and she was carrying all these shopping bags and I said oh let me help you and she's fiercely independent like no 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 I'll carry it and after a while I was walking around and I noticed a lot of people looking at me like what is this guy uh? so unhelpful right so I'm like give me some bags just let me carry it so you're making me look bad you know <laughs> but it is a bit challenging okay final words from any of you now that you've heard from all of us in different areas, different ages, stages of our life as well. What's the takeaway? I would say the main takeaway, it seems like there are some conversations that need to be happening. It seems to be the big blockers that we're not talking about what we want enough. So there are all of these things lost in translation, right? That's expectations, that's values. And that has to be discussed, I think, openly and at the start. And just being able to have that conversation will... I think predict your success a lot more. Mm, yeah. That's true. And having it face to face instead of just through words and chats online. Right, right. Ellen, what do you think? I say don't play games. Just be honest. Like Vanessa said, we can afford to talk more about like what we want in a relationship instead of keep people guessing, you know. I think guessing is just a waste of time. Wow. Okay. But any relationship requires effort. I can tell you having been married for quite a few years now it's still difficult it's not a bit of roses all the time but to be or not to be single I guess that's the question and if you choose to be single that's great but if you choose not to be then it requires some effort and some work and as we've all heard here it's really a proactive choice you make I enjoy my family life, the laughter of voices, the screaming kids, the pain and love, I guess, of caring for another person. It's a new dimension and added layer to my life, which I hope you guys will also achieve one day. So life is all about relationships and most enjoyable when shared. So I guess we should wrap up by saying if you are still single, then maybe now you're ready to mingle? (laughs) Okay, never mind. Yeah, if only the people listening in could see the look on your faces, which I can see now. But thankfully, they can't. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for listening in to Heart of the Matter. The team behind this podcast is Jacqueline Chan, Joanne Chan, Daniel Lee and Crispina Robert. My name's Stephen Chia and I'll see you guys next week.